Hello, friends. Patrick McFarland here of the Liberty Weekly Podcast. Uh, welcome back. I'm coming at you here with episode 88 of the show, which may be found the show notes at libertyweekly.net forward slash 88. And uh, as you can see here, I'm all set up in my new studio, so to speak. Uh, we've moved into the new house, and I'm going to be giving a bit of an update on that, except I'm going to save that for the end of the show, uh, because this is um, more of a scholarly episode of the show, and uh, for those of you who are just passing through for the content, I don't want to uh, take up too much time in the beginning with that. Um, but this one, this episode, is about a libertarian theory of contracts, and uh, I'm, I'm going to dive right into the material here today. Uh, but I would stress that everyone uh, do please follow that show notes page, uh, libertyweekly.net forward slash 88, and you can get uh, view the video version because I do have visual aids and I will be referring to um, some papers here. So it, it'll be uh, beneficial for you guys. You'll get uh, the full breast of the content uh, by viewing the video version or going to youtube.com forward slash libertyweekly, or I would prefer if you subscribed on BitChute at bitshoot.com forward slash Liberty Weekly, uh, which is the free speech decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer alternative, uh, more decentralized, but uh, I'm a big fan of Bitshoot. But um, before I get started here, let's see if I always have trouble minimizing the screen here, but uh, before I get started, I wanted to point everyone towards uh, the Wild Wild Country episodes that we've been doing with Daniel and Robert of the Actual Anarchy podcast, as well as a lot of special guests. The last one was Peaceful Treason. There was Trey Weaver, Tony Rockamora, and um, let's see, I think that's just about everyone guest hosting for us on the show. So you can catch those on here. Uh, apologies if I left out any of the guest hosts, but they're available at libertyweekly.net forward slash WWC, the letters for Wild Wild Country. And as well, um, here are some more of the scholarly episodes that I've done in the past that relate to the topic I'm going to cover here today. Uh, the first one is Liberty Weekly and the Constitution of No Authority, uh, which is episode 28 at libertyweekly.net forward slash 28. I discuss some of the contracts, uh, some of the principles of contract law that I'm going to be go going over today. And I've, I've heard a lot of libertarians talk about the social contract and they try and invoke contract theory. And uh, while some are better than others, I have quibbles uh, being an attorney myself. Um, the contracts have do have rules and um, you know, if you're not familiar with those rules, if you haven't studied those rules, uh, it's hard to articulate them and be an authority on it. And uh, while I'm, not, I'm no expert when it comes to contract law, I do have my legal training to fall back on. So um, I discussed that in episode 28, and we'll be getting into those principles so you can refer to this episode. But um, so episode 28, libertyweekly.net forward slash 28, talking about the social contract and um, libertyweekly.net forward slash 76 as a more recent episode that I've done on the actual foundations of real property law. So discussing, as we're propertarians, just discussing uh, how, how you can own things in our Western legal system in the United States. You know, what does it mean to, be a, uh, to own something in fee simple absolute? Or what does it mean to have a life estate? Or, um, you know, the having property interests subject to condition subsequence. Um, so I would check that out. That was another great video episode that I did at libertyweekly.net forward slash 76 talking about real property. So um, also I'm, I'll do the Patreon plug right away. Liberty or patreon.com forward slash Liberty Weekly. If you uh, enjoy or find um, value in the work that I do here on the show, uh, please do consider stopping by Patreon, becoming a supporter of the show. Um, at different tier levels, you can get access to the meme cache, you get at early access to some of the shows, and as well, um, extras and bloopers and um, things such as that. So uh, thanks so much to all my patrons. I just updated the uh, hosting fund, um, renewed another year of hosting for the website at $120, and I have my $20 a month that I pay for hosting fees. So that's where that money goes. But uh, without further ado, let's dive into the topic here. Um, so I little story to start this off. 
Uh, I do follow Andrew Kern of the Principled Libertarian, and I've been name dropping him in a few episodes, and he always gives me a shout out. But um, he has a great page, that Principled Libertarian, where he talks about uh, he has thought provoking posts. Uh, Andrew is very well read, and um, one of his posts piqued my interest because he kind of, um, not intentionally, but he slapped me down a little bit because. He was talking about, and I would show the post on the screen, but then I'd have to block everyone's names off. Um, but he was talking about how libertarians should not be using the pure Lockean natural rights argument to defend um, why, you know, how we homestead property and how, why property exists. Um, where you know the the John Locke reasoning would go, you know, we've been endowed with these inalienable rights. If you mix your labor with physical property in the world, then it becomes yours. You homestead it. Um, I, I and and Murray Rothbard gets into this, and uh, Walter Block actually mentioned it on the Tom Woods show just recently. And I'll include a link to that in the show notes page. I would include the audio, but it would take too much editing time. But Walter Block was talking about how Murray Rothbard. Uh, was an advocate of the Lockean natural rights um, explanation of how we homestead property. But it wasn't until Hans Hermann Hoppe came along, this 22-year-old hotshot from Germany, and um, had this more convincing argument as to why we own property. And here it is articulated, and I'll be referring to a few, like I said, papers. But... Um, here it is with Stefan Kinsella just kind of goes over it in the first paragraph of his um, his article on a libertarian theory of contract. And this is the article that Andrew Curran linked in this Facebook post uh, because a lot of you libertarians were getting out there and criticizing Andrew for, you know, propagating the idea of the theory of property rights that actually was adopted by Murray Rothbard and Hans Hermann Hoppe. But articulated here uh, by Stefan Kinsella just saying that, well, I mean, it's it's a little bit more of a utilitarian argument here. Let's see, I, I don't like this Zoom, so. Uh, it's a little bit more of a utilitarian argument, I, I find, that we own property because resources are scarce, and without a um, coherent and cogent theory of property rights, we do not know how to um, solve conflicts over these scarce resources. And I just think that, I don't think that these two arguments are mutually exclusive, but I think that this is a more cogent theory that doesn't, you know, rely on this mysterious, um, you know, having rights because we were endowed by our creator or having rights because of our humanity, just because. Um, so this is, this theory is more, I think it's more, um, not coherently, but completely argued by Hans Hermann Hoppe in, uh, let's see, the it wasn't a foot oh yeah here it is in a footnote here Hans Hermann Hoppe theory of socialism and capitalism chapters one and two where Hoppe really goes through that and articulates that theory so I I, I was uh, my interest was piqued by Andrew Kern um, through his Facebook post in this problem and I'll say but in doing so I went down this rabbit hole of a libertarian theory of contract and um, it, it really blew my mind a little bit out of the water because when I was in law school and when I was learning these things, I was trying to keep these spheres separate so that I wouldn't get them mixed up. So I learned the orthodox theory of contract, which has a lot to do with promises, enforcing promises, and uh, a doctrine called consideration, which is um, what we'll be discussing here today. Um, and I, I never really quibbled with it, although I, I'll be upfront about this. I do not like contracts. It's not a body of law that I enjoy studying. Um, I have had a lot of classes in it, but and, and maybe it just doesn't make total sense to me because I've always had these kind of unconscious, you know, it's like a sliver in my mind kind of thing, uh, these quibbles with it. Uh, because, you know, it involves enforcing promises that violate the non-aggression principle. And... Um, so we're going to get into that, but I was discovering these theories of uh, libertarian contract law, which involves the passing of title, and um, I, I, I don't know, it just, it just kind of was a totally different way of looking at it that I had never really considered. So 
Uh, I, I did a deep dive on this and I recorded, this is my third time recording this episode because the first one was not satisfactory. And the second one I realized after the fact was video only and not audio. And now I see the audio is recording. So um, just to dive right in, I wanted to start off with, you know, a basic overview of contract law to begin with. And uh, we're going to start with Barbary. And Barbary is one of the top bar review um like when you're studying for the bar, they do the private bar review courses and they're the best one. They cost the most money. This is for educational purposes only and not for the bar, um, not for studying for the bar. Uh, but this was a free outline that I found on the internet. So this is contracts and sales. And um, usually when you go through contracts and when you learn it in law school, um, it, the way it works in America is that contracts are divided into two different spheres. The sale of goods, any contract for the sale of goods, which is a tangible, movable thing, a good, is governed by the Uniform Commercial Code. Any, any sale of good, $500 or more, are, is governed by Article 2, sale of goods under the UCC, which is kind of like, um, I think every state has adopted the Uniform Commercial Code. It's kind of like the Lex Mercatoria that existed in medieval Europe except that was a product of the market, whereas the UCC is a product of the legislature and a think tank. But we learned a little bit about the creation of the UCC, and I don't want to dwell on it, but I might have another episode on that where the guy who designed the UCC was kind of a libertarian type. Um, maybe not outwardly so, but in action, he created the system by which um, he really tried to capture what contracting parties were doing anyways in the market. That was the point of the UCC from what I've been taught and what I've observed is that, you know, the whole point is to look at what these parties are doing anyways in their normal course of business and try and encapsulate that and allow them to, you know, conduct business. And I mean, you could argue that business wouldn't exist but for the liberal rules of the UCC because the UCC rules are less stringent than actually the common law. And the common law uh, governs contracts, any other contract um, that you would come across, any contract other than the sale of goods. And um, yeah, so let's get into it. Um, right away here, there's the general definition of a contract. And this is what Stefan Kinsella has in his too. Contract theory specifies how rights are transferred as the result of voluntary agreement between the owner and others. While some voluntary agreements are enforceable, others are not. And um, the he, I forgot where I, where this is in the paper, um, but under the Barbary contracts definition, a contract quote is a promise or a set of promises, for the breach of which the law gives a remedy or the performance of which the law in some way recognizes as a duty. So, and this is, you know, the general definition that I learned as well in my contracts course. Uh, my professor always taught us that the contract, a contract is a promise or a set of promises that the law will enforce. Um, so that's pretty much, you know, that's the definition of a contract. Pretty basic stuff here. Um, but there are things that all contracts must have. And as you can see on the screen with this Barbary outline, um, they do... Make sure it's big enough on the screen here for you. But in this Barbary outline, they, they do elaborate, you know, what is a sale? How is a sale defined? What, how are goods defined? Um, but as you see here, generally the common law governs, con governs contracts. However, special rules have been developed for in contracts involving the sale of goods. So these are how they fleece out all those, um, you know, I'm painting very broad brush strokes here, and there's a whole slew of rules that goes down um, beneath this but so you know there's different types of contracts there's an express contract which is formed by language which is oral or written uh, pretty self-explanatory there's an implied in fact contract which are implied contracts are formed by manifestations of assent other than oral or written language i.e. by conduct so if someone sits in a barber's chair and the barber cuts his hair a contract has been formed by the party's conduct uh, likewise, if you go into a restaurant and order food, there's an implied understanding that you're going to pay for that food before you leave. Or if you go into a store and grab something off the shelves uh, and don't conceal it on your person, you go up to the register and there's an implied contract that you're buying the stuff. 
Um, there's a quasi contract or implied in law contract, which quasi contracts are not contracts at all. They are considered by courts to avoid unjust enrichment. So basically, um, quasi contracts are just contracts that the courts make up, um, pretty much. So there's the difference between a bilateral a bilateral contract, which is an exchange of mutual promises, a promise for a promise, i.e. Um, if Sydney promises to sell Blackacre uh, in a state to Bertram for six thousand dollars, and Bertram promises to purchase Blackacre at that price, so uh, I mean, if bilateral contract would be, you know, if I wanted to sell my podcasting equipment to Dave Smith for three hundred dollars, and I promise to sell him uh, sell my equipment at three hundred dollars, and Dave promises to buy it at three hundred dollars, uh, whereas. In contrast, a unilateral contract would be acceptance by performance. So if I wanted Dave Smith to do a comedy routine at my, you know, open mic comedy routine, I'll pay you 30, I don't know, $200. Dave Smith is pretty good. We'll, we'll pay him one G. How about that? So if Dave shows up, I have an open mic and it's agreed that, you know, if Dave shows up and performs the show, I'm going to pay him a hundred, a thousand dollars. Um, it is a promise for a promise made by the um, by one party to another party, and in return, I want a performance. Um, so those are some different types of contracts, and I didn't mean to get in the pickers here, but there's just so much. Um, this is a very very broad area of the law that we're just steaming through here. Um, but the creation of a contract here, there are three things that the courts will look for to find the creation of a contract, right? And I, I think I heard this mentioned in uh, Mance Raider's podcast about the social contract. And Robert Higgs outlined this in his paper, saying that any contract has mutual assent, which consists of offer and acceptance. And we'll get into that. Um, so Robert Higgs said that contract consists of mutual assent, consideration, plus the lack of any defenses to contract formation. Well, we're getting in this here because... Robert Higgs says, you know, these are the three things required for a contract to exist. Uh, but Stefan Kinsella says that, you know, in a libertarian system, and Rothbard and Hoppe says this too, but in a libertarian system, we would not have consideration. Consideration would go away, and instead we would have, um, is title being transferred? We would only look to see, rather than looking for consideration, which we'll define in a moment, Rather than looking for consideration, we're going to be looking for the passage of title from one party to the other, or the pledging of a passage of title from one party to the other. And then the third thing would be defenses to contract formation, or the lack of defenses, because if there is a contract, there has to be no defenses to contract formation. Um, so mutual assent consists of offer and acceptance from the offeror to the offeree. Um, let's see here. Yeah, right here. If you're watching the video version, which you should be, because you, you'd be getting all of this uh, laid out in front of you. So, the the offer is an objective uh, an objective offer that signals to the offeree that acceptance of the offer would conclude the deal, right? Um, so, right here is as you can see. So, mutual assent is often said to be an agreement on the same on the same bargain at the same time, or a meeting of the minds. And I think meeting of the minds is kind of antiquated, so we'll give Barbary a pass here. But um, modernly, the courts look for objective measures of manifestation of, you know, that, that a deal has come to place. So an actual subjective meeting of the minds is not necessary. Rather, courts use an objective measure by which each party is bound to the apparent intention that they manifested assent to the others, to the other parties. Um, so, like I said, you know, the offer has to um, indicate to the offeree that acceptance would conclude the deal. Likewise, on the other end, the offeree has to accept the deal. And the, the, the offeror, the person making the offer, can, can determine how communication of acceptance is acceptable, if that makes sense. So the offeror can say, you know, Dave, I want to sell you my podcasting equipment for $300. If you accept this deal, you must send a carrier pigeon that has, you know, a blood seal on it 
Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, send a carrier pigeon on Tuesday of next week, and that's the only way for you to accept this deal. And Dave would be bound, if he wanted to accept the deal, he would have to respond by sending a carrier pigeon with his blood seal on it. And that's the only way. I can determine I'm the master of the offer. I'm the offeror. I can determine how I want to accept acceptance. Uh, but generally, you know, any reasonable method to communicate acceptance is okay. Um, so the offeree has to communicate acceptance in a reasonable time or however the offer um, says, says, you know, that acceptance can be communicated. Um, but the, the acceptance has to be a mirror image of the offer. And that's called the mirror image rule. Um, so you can see how they're in this um, this outline. If you're watching the video version, you can see you know all the nuances that they go through. You know what if there's terms missing? What if the price term is missing? You know um, all these different cases, the the problems that have come up. And um, let's see if I can get to acceptance. But acceptance has to be the mirror image of the offer. Because if the acceptance is not a mirror image, not the exact same thing, here's the acceptance. Um, if the acceptance does not mirror the offer itself, then it's not an acceptance at all. It's just a counter offer. So if I was to say, hey, Dave, I want to sell you my podcasting equipment for 300 bucks, And Dave says, yeah, I'll buy it for $301. Well, that's not an acceptance. That is Dave saying... No, I'm not going to buy it for 300. I'll buy it for, or he would say, you know, 280 dollars. Uh, well, no, that's not a mirror image. And um, so, that's kind of the first step. You can see all the nuances here um, of uh, different situations, different contracts you could get into, uh, different little problems. Uh, but we're not concerned with that for the purposes of of today. But um, so. Mutual assent consists of offer and acceptance, a valid offer and a valid acceptance of said offer. Um, consideration, and this is where we're kind of going to get into the, let's see if I can find consideration. This is where we're going to get into the uh, Stefan Kinsella part, because this is where Kinsella really quibbles with it. But... Um, well, let, let, just to go back to the orthodox version of contracts, because I, I wanted to follow the structure of his paper, A Libertarian Theory of Contracts. So first in the introduction, he outlines, you know, the Hoppian theory of contracts and wh how each part of the law plays into that. You know, property theory concerns how you get property and how you transfer those property rights or how you lose them. Tort or, tort or criminal law concerns how acts of aggression or negligence change rights to scarce resources. Whereas contract theory specifies how rights are transferred as the result of voluntary agreement between the owner and others. Um, he gets into, you know, a broad brush strokes of contract like I just walked you through here. Um, oh, yes, but another part is damages. And, and that is really where libertarian legal theory comes in. You know, you have offer and acceptance, mutual assent, you have consideration, you have the lack of any defenses. Um, and then you have damages because the court has to come in and decide how they're going to solve this. Are we, are we going to say that, you know, actually there was no contract here because either mutual assent was lacking or there was no consideration or there was no, or, or maybe there's a defense to contract formation. Like maybe one party was incapacitated or one, one party was um, coerced into it, which libertarians would, you know, um, quibble with, you know, no coercion. Uh, maybe one party lied or misrepresented. Um, those are all things that would, you know, the court would look at and see, well, there was no contract to begin with because he was holding a gun to your head. Um, but when, when, when the courts do find that there was a contract, well, there's the question of how, how do we provide damages? Um, the, the biggest thing here that Kinsella kind of gets at is, you know, usually the courts even now will not order directed performance. They won't usually. And direct performance or specific performance would be if, um, okay, so I contract to sell the my podcasting equipment to Dave Smith for $300. Um, if, 
if Dave agrees and communicates his acceptance and we have all those things, mutual assent, consideration, and lack of defenses, what if, what if I fail to deliver the podcasting equipment and Dave really wants the podcasting equipment? Let's say he, you know, has made all these plans to record this show uh, with Robbie the Fire or something. And um, he has paid for studio time at Gas Digital. Uh, well, he, he doesn't have my specific equipment. He has lost money because he was relying on buying my equipment and having it. So he lost, let's say, $500 because... Um, I failed to deliver the podcasting equipment. Well, he wants to sue me, and he wants the podcasting equipment and the $500. Um, well, the $500 would be an expectation, right? Because he expected to get the podcasting equipment. He made all these investments in reliance upon getting the podcasting equipment. Um, that would be expectation damages that the court would order. And usually they would order damages um, if you can prove it, if it's provable. Um, now, there's there's different theories of damages that you could get. Um, you could get rescission of the contract, which would treat it as if, you know, there was no contract at all. That's a possibility if the party seeking enforcement of the contract wants that. Um, but on the other hand, Kinsella's point, and sorry for the roundabout way of reaching this, uh, but Kinsella's overall point is that even now the courts will not order specific performance. The courts will not force me to sell the post, force me to sell slash deliver the podcasting equipment to Dave Smith. They would order expectation damages, or they would order um, maybe restitution damages. Excuse me. Uh, they, maybe they would do that depending on you know what the case was about or you know what kind of contract this was whether it was a construction contract or a mortgage contract or um, a service contract uh, different different theories of damages how to calculate them show up but there's like damages there's rescission of the contract which would be treating it as if there was no contract or there's specific performance and the courts usually nowadays will not order specific performance unless it's a sale of real estate um, or unless it's like a very unique piece of property that's being sold, like a painting, a unique painting. Um, but they will not order specific performance for service contracts, right? Um, and this is one of the biggest things that Kinsella gets into, and Rothbard points out as well, is that let's say, um, you know, instead of me selling my podcasting equipment, I hired Dave Smith to give a comedy routine at my comedy club. And Dave Smith, Dave Smith doesn't show up, right? Well, would the courts force him to show up? Not even now they wouldn't do that. The courts would not order Dave specifically to perform. And um, because that would, I mean, the courts would not order him to perform, but they would rather, in a service contract, they would order him to pay me the money that I lost for his non-performance. And um, this is where libertarianism comes in because that would violate the non-aggression principle, right? So that would be a, like a slavery contract and um, or the, the spe ordering the specific performance of Dave's service contract would constitute slavery. And this is where Kinsella gets into it because if, if Dave makes a promise to show up and do the comedy routine, he has promised me something. Well, when the after the after the contract is broken, the courts would either would either order him to perform, which they wouldn't do, or they would um, order him to pay me money, the money I lost in anticipating his performance. Well, then Kinsella asks the question, you know, if if the court is going to be using violence to compel Dave to pay me money for, you know, the money that I lost from him promising to perform the comedy routine at my uh, comedy club, then the promise must have been aggression, right? Because the, the only way that the courts can institute aggression is in response to violence or aggressive action. So Kinsella tackles the problem of is a promise, is breaking a promise, does that constitute aggression? If Dave promises me to show up and he fails his promise, is that aggression? Well, no, Kinsella says. Um, so 
Why, why does make? I'm quoting here. Why does making a promise or agreeing or committing to do something result in a transfer of rights from the promisor to the promisee? Because you know, if if we are going to be, um, if we are not going to be violating the non-aggression principle, if our direction for of Dave to pay me does not violate the non-aggression principle, then there has to be a transfer of rights in a promise, right? Um, and there isn't. So. To many, he says, so to, re, um, to recap, why does making a promise or agreeing or committing to do something result in a transfer of rights from the promisor to the promisee? To many, and even to many libertarians, it seems elementary and obvious that if you promise to do something, you may be forced to do it. Some libertarians and laymen assume that an individual has some power or ability to legally bind or obligate himself by simply promising to do something. However, this assumption is groundless. Not all promises are enforceable, and nor should they be. So as I said, as a general matter, libertarians hold that the use of force is permissible only in response to initiated force. Viewed in property terms, property may be used only with the consent of its owner. Unprovoked aggression against another is a use of his property or his body without his consent and is therefore prohibited. As a result, the act of aggression, the, as a result of the act of aggression, the victim becomes entitled to use the aggressor's property or body for purposes of punishment. That is, by committing aggression, using a victim's property without consent, some or all of the aggressor's property rights are transferred to the victim. Because the aggressor used the victim's property as if it were his own, although it is not, the victim may use the aggressor's property as if it were his own. This is why initiated force is impermissible, while responsive force... Um, sorry for that, I just kind of read a justification of the non-aggression principle. But uh, you, you can see the problem here, is that, you know, if, if Dave... Dave is not doing anything by promising me to show up. If he does not show up, you know, that doesn't mean that I can enslave him and force him to show up just because he promised to. That would be a violation of the non-aggression principle. And why? You know, and why? Well, we're getting into um, Rothbard here talking about the title transfer theory of contract. You know, and right away this concerns... You know, what, what rights do we have that are inalienable and which ones are alienable? Rothbard would say the only contracts can only exist when we pledge alienable property and when we pledge to transfer alienable property. As Rothbard and Evers point out, a binding contract, I'm quoting from uh, Kinsella's paper, a binding contract should be considered as one or more transfers of title to alienable property, usually title transfers exchanged for each other. A contract should have nothing to do with promises, which at most serve as evidence of a transfer of title. A contract is nothing more than a way to give something you own to another person, right? Title, um, so so that's that's kind of this in a nutshell. That's kind of the libertarian title theory transfer of contract. We're replacing this doctrine of consideration with trying to objectively determine whether or not title is transferred from one party to another. That's all we need to do. That's all we're looking for. Is there offer and acceptance that equals mutual consent? Has title transferred between the two parties? And are there any defenses to contract formation? Those are the three questions. And uh, so there's two more things I wanna talk about as I'm wrapping it up here. One are the problems with consideration. Um, quibbles that we have with consideration um, and the other one is you know how, how do we do service contracts then because if they're if your will is inalienable how could we ever get that contract to be enforceable where Dave Smith has to show up and do my comedy routine um, because if you know if he's not pledging any title then how would any service contract exist uh, well, never fear, there's an answer to that. I'll tackle that one before I do consideration. Um, let's see here. It's, it is answered in this paper, property and the body. Um, let's see, I wrote this down right here. Promises only. It's kind of towards the end here, apologies. Theft and debtor's prison. So basically, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty 
I'm kind of searching here, sorry. But um, it, it's a pretty easy question to answer, right? Answer, right? So if Dave tries to show up to, um, I have this, you know, contract with Dave. I'm going to pay him, I don't know, one grand to show up and do my comedy routine. And how am I ever going to get him to show up? If, if I can't, if the court will not enforce promises regarding services, uh, because that would violate the non-aggression principle. Well, Rothbard says, well, every employment contract then would just have to have, um, a liquidated damages provision is what it's called. And these do exist um, actually rather frequently, uh, which would be basically two parties contract to do something. Um, before they even sign the contract, they have a liquidated damages provision that say, well, in the event of the other party's non-performance, the other party agrees that they will pay $3,000. Um, and it, it's just, you know, clean hands, we're done with it. If, if there is a problem with performance of this contract, we're going to take it to court or we'll take it to arbitration. And, um, th I mean, it, that's, that's it right there. The court might evaluate the liquidated pr damages provision and see if it's fair and fair enough for them to execute it. Um, but more often than not, they, they will go with it. Um, and it, it really depends on the court. You know, when, when you're talking about all these things, the, the only useful question is, okay, well, what will the court enforce? What has the courts enforced? What have the courts enforced in the past? Um, because two parties can agree on anything they want, but without enforcement mechanisms, their agreements don't really matter. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I, I apologize for this. I'm not really finding the part where um, Rothbard or Kinsella discusses Rothbard talking about this. Um, but the other, the other problem is this question of consideration. And, um, yeah, so there's a lot of discussion here about inalienability and whether you can alienate your will. I think that's kind of the linchpin of this title theory of contract. Um, yeah, this is it right here. Rothbard on inalienability. Uh, so let, let's dive into this before I tackle consideration. Let's see, I don't want to just read the whole thing outright, because you can read this, and I'll include links to these in the show notes page. But Rothbard viewing contracts as transferred, I'm quoting, as transfers of title to alienable property rejected the enforceable promises view of contracts, with mere promises being unenforceable. He also maintained that rights to control, i.e. one's ownership of or title to one's body, were inalienable. So that's the argument. Walter Block would disagree, and I'd be curious um, to see if he had anything to say about this issue specifically regarding contracts, but he says, uh, Kinsella continues, these views are not unrelated. In fact, promises being unenforceable necessarily implies the inalienability of the body and vice versa. If promises were enforceable, then one could be punished or coerced into performing, implying some rights in the body had been alienated merely by making the promise. And if one could alienate title to one's body by an act of will, this would mean that promises could be enforceable. For example, one could make a conditional transfer of title to one's body if one does not perform a, spe a specified service. This would justify punishment or coercion, coercion against the promisor's body, which is now owned by the promisee. Thus, alienability of the body and the enforceable promises view of contract go hand in hand. One implies the other. And just a note on consideration, and I'll get into this, but just as I'm looking at this now, it, it, it doesn't appear to me as if... Um, so if you could... If you could alienate your bodily will, as Rothbard says you can't, I still think that would still justify libertarian theory of contract. Even if you could alienate your will for your body, consideration still would not work. And the libertarian title theory would still work. You'd just be transferring title to your body for that specific performance, for the purposes of that. Uh, but there's a few reasons why we don't the courts don't enforce specific performance and i kind of touched on this just two minutes ago when i was talking about how um 
You know, the, the only thing that matters in a contract is what the courts will enforce. And the reason why courts don't enforce specific performance is not really for any kind of philosophical reasons. It's just logistically, it's really hard. That's an extreme remedy to enforce someone to do something like that, to force them to. And also, you know, if you force someone or make them do it or order them to do it through the courts, they might do kind of a shitty job. So you have that too. Um, but yeah, um, so one really implies the other. We kind of talked about enforceable promises in alienability. I won't dwell on that too much longer, but just to touch briefly as we end here on consideration and the antiquated doctrine of consideration. Uh, one of the biggest problems that Mises, uh, well, let me define consideration first. Uh, it's kind of the bargain for exchange of the parties um, elements of consideration. So basically two, ele and here's the Barbary outline, but basically two elements are necessary to constitute consideration. One, there must be a bargain for exchange between the parties. And two, so a bargain for exchange is that each party is giving up something um, for something else. And you can give up something by refraining to do something that you have a right to do. That's okay, too. So you could pledge, you know, I'll refrain from smoking, which I have a right to do, in exchange for $300 or something. Um, or I'll, I'll refrain from, I'll refrain from um, suing you in court if you give me something. That's something you could do. Um, so the bargain for exchange and the second thing of consideration is that which is bargained for must be considered of legal value or as it is traditionally stated it must constitute a benefit to the promisor or a detriment to the promisee. At the present time the detriment element is emphasized in determining whether an exchange contains legal value. Um, so right away as libertarians, as Misesian libertarians, we should... Um, we should have some quibbles with this already because what is what is value? How, how, how are the courts going to step in and determine what's valuable and what isn't? Because we know value is subjective. That is the Misesian insight is that value is subjective. So how, is, how are the courts going to step in and determine, you know, what side is giving up what um, if they try? But then again, if they tried to get into the heads of, you know, each party and determine what subjective, you know, what party subjectively thinks that they're giving up. Uh, and this was a big question in my contracts class. You know, are we going to look to the objective manifestations, objective signs of what the parties considered to be the deal and what the deal is? Or are we going to look into their minds and trying to determine what their subjective state of mind was? And you can't do that. You know, you. But, but that really gets to the, the, the reason why the courts can't do that there's a real problem here. The reason why the courts can't do that, even though that's what they have to do, because we know value is subjective, but at the same time, um, the courts can't subjectively determine what the value was. It'd be very hard to do that. And I think that's why consideration doesn't work. Um, and that's why we should go towards, you know, looking to see objectively whether title is transferred, because that, you know, you can objectively prove whether title has been transferred or not. Other problems with consideration and the bigger ones that Kinsella talks about, um, I you could do a deep dive on what I just said about subjective value. Um, but he, he basically just said, you know, consideration doesn't hold enforceable promises that we would or it doesn't hold enforceable contracts that maybe should really should be enforced like um, detrimental reliance and promissory estoppel. Um, and promissory estoppel being, you know, a contract where the, the classic example is the grandfather who uh, pledges to pay for his granddaughter's tuition. Um, that would be unenforceable under consideration theory because the, the granddaughter is not giving anything, but yet she needs to rely on that promise in order to, you know, rent a house, uh, pay for groceries, uh, attend class and all those different things. Um, so, so we would think that should be reliable or that would be an enforceable contract, but under the consideration doctrine, that wouldn't necessarily be. And so the courts knowing this and taking this and seeing these cases where, you know, these things should be enforceable, but they're not according to our accepted theory of contracts, they just created this doctrine called promissory estoppel, uh, which is 
Um, it has certain elements that I, I can't rattle off. Um, well, actually, here it is, right here in the paper. So promissory estoppel is this. A promise which the promisor should reasonably expect to induce action or forbearance on the part of the promisee or a third person and which does induce such action or forbearance is binding if injustice can be avoided only by enforcement of the promise. The remedy granted for breach may be limited as justice requires. Well, what the hell does that mean? That That's just made up. That's not grounded in any kind of logic. Um, basically... Uh, well, these are the elements, is that the promisor makes a promise that should reasonably expect to induce action or, or reliance, and there is reliance by the promisee, and if justice, if injustice can be avoided only by enforcing the promise. So those are the three elements. Um, it, it's just kind of made up. It's not really grounded in, in logic or here's the detrimental reliance or if it if it would be unconscionable not to find a contract let's say you know the the granddaughter jacked up all this she racked up all this debt and she you know went to college and all of a sudden two years in grandpa wants to pull the rug out from under her well the courts would find a contract there because she relied on it she relied on his promise um so yeah i i think that really covers as much as everything i tried to keep this short uh, but I see it's around 45 minutes. I hope you didn't get bored. Uh, this is some really thick stuff. And um, I really hope that I was able to give everyone in the libertarian community a very broad brush stroke of what contract law is about. Um, there's so much more of a deep dive to do here. Uh, like if you're looking at the page here, um, you can see all of the page numbers of this and this is a bare bones outline just for the bar exam like so when i say i was studying for the bar exam i was reading outlines like this all day long so well not just that but you know trying to cram all this into my thick head so it's uh it's a lot of stuff so when you're talking about the social contract or when you are talking about contracts in general this is the body of law currently and i'm still scrolling for you listening to the audio version only uh which shame on you <laughs> friendly shame but um look at all this i'm still scrolling through the table of contents here 130 pages of this so contracts have rules please try not to speak with authority about contracts without first having looked at or studied this um it's not really amorphous it's pretty uh, I mean, the social contract is, and the Constitution is amorphous and doesn't comply with these. Uh, but I've done work on that, like I said at the beginning of the show, libertyweekly.net forward slash 28. Um, so yeah, check out, I'm going to include, you know, everyone should go and read Stefan Kinsella, or Stefan Kinsella's uh, article here, A Libertarian Theory of Contract, Title Transfer, Binding Promises, and Inalienability. I found it to be very helpful. I would read this first before you dive into Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty chapter on the same because uh, Stefan, or Stefan, sorry, Stefan, I don't know how exactly, I, I keep thinking Stefan Molyneux, and so I go to that, but um, everyone should go to this. He kind of holds your hand through it a little bit, whereas Rothbard just does a deep dive, and I think it's chapter 19 in the Ethics of Liberty. Um, yep, on one, page 133. But he, he uses the legalese terms without, you know, defining them or really holding your hand through it. So um, I would go through to that. But so a, as I promised in the beginning, I wanted to tell, just talk a little bit about, you know, just the moving process and everything. I think I did all my plugs. So Patreon, do please check out DonorC at DonorC.com and consider supporting some of those projects. It's like Uber for charity. Really cool. You get to see your money working literally where it goes. Um, also, the Libertarian Union, I forgot to tell everyone this, but the Libertarian Union, our talk shows, our State of the Libertarian Union talk shows, now have their own podcast feed. So if you go to libertarianunion.com and you can find all of our shows there as well as a subscription to the Apple podcast feed 
itself for our talk shows. And there should be another one coming up tonight, actually. Uh, but go check that out. You can see all of our the member shows here. And um, it's a real good place. With We have some new members. Uh, but please do go check that out. And check out, subscribe to that podcast feed. So Because I won't be launching our talk shows in this feed anymore. Uh, I also had a really good conversation with Kyle Anzalone, some bonus content that we went through, uh, just having a chat with him about something other than foreign policy, uh, just going and hitting up some of those topics because Kyle Anzalone is the host of Foreign Policy Focus, and he doesn't really get a chance to talk about anything else too much. Um, but, yeah, we we moved into the, the new house. Um I'm really loving it. It's it's really cool to be a, a property owner. Uh, it's pretty important uh, in the in the propertarian sense, but uh, it's been a lot more busy and involving than I thought it would be, and that's kind of a a theme going through. I didn't think it'd be easy. I knew there was a lot of work to to be done around here, but um, I haven't been coming out with a lot of content because I've been busy, you know, cleaning, unboxing things. I just helped my uncle move the other day, and um, that was a big job, which maybe I'll get into in the Patreon content because that's a hell of a story, um, thinking AMC Hoarders style stuff. And maybe that's not AMC, maybe TLC or something, but that show Hoarders. Yeah, it was it was a big job, but I also, um, I love my uncle, by the way. But I also power washed the house in the last few days. I w- I'm working on power washing the deck, which was very neglected. Um, cut it. We cut some trees down, you know, doing all the lawn care and maintenance. And um, what else did I do? There's been a lot of stuff, you know, just moving in and everything. So apologies that I haven't been coming out with content. Uh, there's a few big name creators that I want to be working with that I've been in contact with. Uh, so I want to bring that to you. Um, but also, I'm sh- I should be starting my job in the next few weeks, um, hopefully next week, if not the week after. Uh, but I find out on August 29th whether or not I pass the bar exam. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I-, I don't know if I want to tell you guys the results. I mean, if I pass, I sure will. But if I don't, I don't know. I And then the next time would- to take the bar exam would be in February. So... But I'm excited to to be working now and to bringing, you know, all you guys my legal experience. And I I really want to be doing more of the substantive stuff because, you know, there's a real disconnect, I feel, between, um, I hate to say laymen, but people who aren't legally trained um, speaking with authority on these legal subjects that, I mean, let me tell you, they're they're pretty complicated. And uh, they're written in English and you could probably figure it out, but the i don't want to say you have to have legal training but it it sure helps and it's i mean even that's they call it practicing law because there's so much out there and it's so complicated that you never master it it's like being a doctor you're always practicing medicine and practicing law and i guess i'm just trying to help you guys really get the right info because i've seen a lot of people out there who are i don't think they're purposely giving misinformation like the the legal loophole people or the people who think like sovereign citizens or um posse comitatus or um people who think that you know because the united states assented to this treaty in 1977 means that you can sue to have your humanitarian rights that you can sue in district court to have your humanitarian rents rights restored according to this treaty and i it, it's uh, it's a legal positivist argument that you're making, and it's bullshit. And um, a bunch of conclusory statements and jailhouse attorneys, I've seen this all over the, the internet, and even some of my followers um, eat that stuff up, and it's, it's not right, let me tell you. So um, be really careful out there. Uh, this is not legal advice. If, if you're facing real charges, consult an attorney. But... So I, I want to bring this to a close. I really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to listen to me. Uh, maybe I'll post some house updates in the Patreon feed. Uh, but but check out the Libertarian Union. Uh, we're going to be doing a State of the Libertarian Union talk show. And um, subscribe to that podcast feed. Uh, but also, I just wanted to ask everyone, if you have the time, please, let's see here, please go give my give the Liberty Weekly podcast a review on iTunes. 
or Google Play Music. I have the badges on the website at libertyweekly.net. Please consider going and giving me a rating and review. It really helps my exposure here. I can see I got 15 ratings. Thank you to all you guys. Um, but put your put your rating or review in here and bring it to my attention at patrick.mcfarlane at libertyweekly.net. That's my email. And uh, I'll be sure to mention it on the show. So, all right. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to be back with another substantive episode, uh, but it shouldn't be too long. So hang on to your butts. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, sorry guys, um, at the libertarianinstitute.org, uh, I now have my own pod, I've, I've been publishing on the site for a little while now, but I now have my own section for the Liberty Weekly podcast. If you go to the website, libertarianinstitute.org, on the right-hand column towards the bottom, you can see my Liberty Weekly podcast where I've been posting these episodes as well. And uh, special thanks to Scott Horton and Sheldon Richmond for um, you know viewing my content as being worthy enough to be on the libertarianinstitute.org. It's a real big honor. And uh, I've been posting you know our episodes and our Wild Wild Country stuff there. Um, please check that out. Please support the libertarianinstitute.org. Uh, like I said, it's a huge honor. Uh, if you can follow my my page here, yeah. So I'll I'll also put a link there to, at libertyweekly.net forward slash libertarian institute, uh, or liber, uh, libertyweekly.net forward slash li. The letters L and I. So you can find that there. Uh, also, the the final episode, I promised six episodes, but I think it's. Um, We've had enough of Wild Wild Country for the time being, but we're going to recap it up with uh, the capstone on it, which is Sherry Voluntary is going to come in and talk about her experience, her personal experience being in a cult. And we have kind of uh, put that back. Um, we've had scheduling issues with that, so it's kind of gone back a little bit, but that is going to be summing up the Wild Wild Country. At this point, I'm not sure if I'm going to be joining or not, uh, but we're so stoked to have Sherry Voluntary be joining us and uh, to share a very intimate story about her own experience and uh, maybe uh, a word of warning uh, perhaps a little bit there too. So very excited for that. Be sure to keep your eyes peeled. Thank you. Thank you.